Okay, so today we're going to do some factoring of polynomials, and I'm trying to make videos uh, split into several parts so that you can take a little chunk at a time uh, and go through some of the common rules for factoring and the expectations we have in this class. Uh, so when we're factoring polynomials, the first thing we would expect you to do, or the step one you should be looking for, is always look for the greatest common factor. Now, there are some instances where you could, like if you forgot at the beginning, you can kind of catch it in the end, and we'll talk about that as we go along. However, the best standard common practice would be always to factor out the GCF at the very beginning and then worry about anything else that needs to be factors after that. Um, one of the rules that we have, especially if the polynomial expression is uh, in one variable and the leading coefficient is negative, you must factor out a, a negative one. So it says here, if the leading coefficient of a polynomial expression is, in one variable is negative, then we must factor out a negative one at the very least. Sometimes there can be other things that do, like a number or a variable that can be taken out. The way to determine if the leading coefficient is negative, it's not the, not the term that is in the front. You have to put the, for you to say that, you have to put the terms in descending order, meaning the highest exponent goes first and then all the way down to the constant term. You order them like the highest, next highest exponent, and so forth. And this rule only applies if there's one variable. If there's more than one variable, you don't have to do this. So if we look at example one, we have two variables in there, so we don't need to worry about the leading coefficient being negative. You can just factor normally. So in the first example, part A, we're looking for the GCF. It looks like they all have an X and they all have a Y. The Xs have an X squared in common, and Y is to the first power. And if you look at the 5, the 3, and the 9, there's no common factor for any of those. So I, all I can factor out is an x squared, oh, I'm sure I do this right, an x squared, a y, and then we leave behind um, a 5x squared minus 3xy plus 9y squared. Now, eventually, you should always mentally check, like, whatever is left over, that that has been factored fully. Um, in this case, it's a trinomial if you guys remember the AC method, you would multiply the 5 and the 9 and see, oh, 45, are there factors of 45 that add up and give me negative 3? In this case, the answer to that is no. So now we have fully factored this. And even though we can only factor out a single term or a monomial, it is factorable. Like this, we end up with two things that are the product of something. Now try B. If you look at B, in this case, we have just a single variable, so I have to make sure that the term with the highest exponent for x is in front. In this particular case, it happens to be negative, so we need to make sure that we factor out a negative number. It could be negative 1, it could be negative x, it could be negative, in this case it happens to be negative 3, and an x can be taken out. So always keep that in mind. So for our case here, one variable, uh, it's in one variable, and the leading coefficient is negative. That means we have to factor out the negative. I Negative 3x is going to be your GCF. Now, if it had had another variable in any of the terms, then you would not have to do this. You could just take out the 3x then. Part C, this one is kind of an interesting one as well, because in this case, I have two terms. My two terms are this one and this one. And what I tell people if they get a little bit confused here is that you could pick a letter for x minus 4 temporarily. So I could say, oh, let a equal x minus 4, and then rewrite this as 5xa plus 3a. Then it's easier to see that a is the common factor that I can take out, which gives me uh, a times 5x plus 3, but a was x minus 4. So that means then when I factor this, I can take out um, an x minus 4, and I'm left with a 5x plus 3. Some people can do that no problem. They see that right away. But if you need to just temporarily in the beginning 
kind of substitute in a different letter for the thing that they both have in common. In this case, it's the x minus 4. Each of those two terms have that common factor. It just happens to be not, not be a monomial. In this case, it's a binomial. That whole thing can be taken out. So I want you to just pause the video and try D right now. It's very similar to what we just did. So in part D, again, there are three terms. So if I look at these three, three, one term, two term, three terms, they're separated by pluses and minuses, and the rest in each of the terms are products. That means things are being multiplied. The common factor for this is the x squared plus 1. So that means similar to part C, uh, I can take out a full binomial. So I take out the x squared plus 1. Now, common practice here, Technically, it is factored completely at this stage right here. But we tend to always put um, things, if there's only one variable, in descending order uh, for each of the terms. So the x squared plus 1 is in descending order. However, the 3x squared minus 7 plus 2x is not in descending order. I would actually switch these two's positions so that it goes down, like the exponent is 2, and then 1, and then 0 for the constant. So we are just going to rearrange that as a common practice. Especially if you're doing a multiple choice test, it would be in descending order, most likely. All right, so that's step number one. Step number one is looking for a GCF. What's a common factor that I can take out? Sometimes it's just a number. Sometimes it's a negative one. Sometimes it can have variables in it. Sometimes it could be a binomial or a trinomial, or some other polynomial they all have in common. Uh, but once you've done that, step number two is to check for special products. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, grouping under that. The special products are, for example, the difference of squares, which we'll deal with in a second. Um, there's also the perfect square trinomials is a special product. And the sum and difference of cubes is a special one. So those we should always look for first, because if they exist, I can then do the factoring very quickly and very easily. So if we look, at, the first thing most people look for is the difference of squares because they feel like they are easy. So what we're going to do is then um, look at the difference of squares. It ends up being, oh, in this case, we have x, no, a squared minus b squared is equal to, and these two uh, factors, do you notice that they're exactly the same except for the sign in between? The special name for that is called conjugates. So we actually call the relationship between those two factors conjugates. They are exactly the same except for the sign in between. So for example, if I had uh, something like this, x plus 3, its conjugate would be x minus 3. If I have 7y minus 5, its conjugate would be 7y plus 5. So the only difference is they're exactly the same except for the sign in between. The reason why they need to be conjugates is based on when we multiply these things together, I need to, the middle terms to cancel out. So I hope you remember from Algebra 1, when you multiply two binomials, there's different ways of doing this. Most people learn it by using um, FOIL. Or you could use like a chart, or you could use a uh, double distribution. In this case, I'm just going to use FOIL by multiplying the first. That's a squared. Outer, that's negative ab. Inner is negative or positive ab. This is how we get to have no middle term in here because it's negative ab plus ab. They cancel out and gives me zero. So And then the last is negative b squared. So essentially, we need these guys to cancel out so that I end up with a squared minus b squared. And the only way that that can happen, you get opposite signs in there in these middle terms that I'm highlighting here, this be a negative and this is a positive, is if they are conjugates of each other. So armed with that information, if you see that you have the difference of squares, like for example, 2a, I know that, oh, wait, I have a perfect square minus another perfect square. I then can factor it using conjugates. You just have to take the square root of the first term and the square root of the last term and put those square roots into conjugates. So if you look at this one here, the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 16 is 4. So it's going to be x minus 4, x plus 4. If I multiply these two things back together, the middle terms 
the outer and the inner term, one is negative 4x and the other is positive 4x, they would cancel each other out and therefore we would, left, we would be left with just x squared minus 16. And also to get this minus on the end there, I need the negative 4 and the 4 to be opposite signs. Otherwise, I would not get a negative 16. I would end up, if they're the same sign, I would end up getting a positive 16. Okay. Try B right now. The, go, you need step one for this one. And then you do the difference of squares. So step one is taking out the GCF, which happens to be a two in this case. And then what I'm left with is the difference of squares, which is then I know it's going to be conjugate. So you take the square root of 25x squared is 5x, and the square root of one is one. So therefore, in this case, we end up with two is still there, and then the product of the two conjugates. Why are the factors of difference of squares conjugates? I just answered that out here. You need them to be conjugates to cancel out the middle term, so you end up with just two terms instead of three terms. I need the two to be opposite signs so that they cancel each other out. So if we ask this on a test, you should be able to answer that. All right. Number part C here. This is where the most common mistakes happen on the test for this in our classes. First of all, it is in one variable and the leading coefficient is not um, 81. Even though it stands there first, you need to rewrite that in descending order if you are struggle with that. So in this case, the leading coefficient in this case um, is a negative. It's not negative 1, but it's actually, ooh, I wrote that wrong. It's negative 30. 6. It's this guy here. So what I suggest you do, if you kind of struggle with that a little bit, is rewrite it in descending order. So rewrite in descending order, if needed, and we're going to write negative 36 uh, p squared plus 81. That means I know I'm factoring out a negative. In this case, the common factor for negative 36 and 81 is going to be negative 9. So I have to factor out the negative 9, which then leaves me 4p squared minus 9. And that now is ready to be factored. Now, it, again, if there was another variable in there, I wouldn't have to worry about that. But in this case, there is. So that means I would end up with like the square root of 4p squared is 2p, and the square root of 9 is 3. So we get negative 9. But number one mistake for these difference of squares is not factoring out a negative when you're supposed to. So that's something you really need to write a note to yourself in your, in your notebook. All right. Part D. This one, as a matter of fact, is also a difference of squares. I, any multiple uh, exponent that is a multiple of 2 is a perfect square. Just keep that. If it was a 6, if it was an 8, if it was a 10, if it was 12, all of those exponents are actually... Uh, perfect squares because I could rewrite, for example, if I had a to the, just to make it up, a to the 12th, I could rewrite that as a to the 6th raised to the second power. That's why that works. So that means it's a perfect square. So again, this is the difference of squares, but I when I factor that, it's going to end up being a squared minus b squared times a squared. They're conjugates plus b squared. But because you're asked to factor, and our expectations would be to factor completely, you can factor this again because there is still a difference of squares. The only issue is this one, is the sum of squares. That actually does not factor. So I want you to think about that when we get down here to the bottom. Why is that? So here, we're going to factor this fully, but this one should stay the same, folks. This one here, you cannot factor this. You cannot factor the sum of squares. My question is, why is that, I wonder, right? Here, why are we not able to factor the sum of squares? Why are we not able to factor the sum of squares? All right, there are two schools of thought for this. One is, if I took the sum of squares, let's say a squared plus b squared out here, I could rewrite this as a squared plus zero ab 
plus b squared. And what you learned about in Algebra 1, trinomials, like factoring trinomials, remember you take the factors of the product of the first and the last term that add them and give me the middle term. So we need to find factors of a squared times b squared that will then add up and give me a zero. But because it's positive, I know that it's going to be a times b and a times b would be the only way I could get that middle term split into two parts. And here, I need for them to be opposite signs or else I wouldn't get a zero. But because I need, this is a plus here, they need to be the same sign. This plus here is the problem, right? For me to get a zero in there, one has to be positive and one has to be negative. But wait a minute, when I multiply a positive times a negative, that gives me a negative, not a positive there. So therefore, that won't work, that's factoring the sum. Some people also, there's another way to explain it, is to say, okay, I could brute force it. I could try everything, a plus b times a plus b as a possibility. a plus b times a minus b as a possibility a minus b times a plus b as a possibility, a minus b times a minus b as a possibility, and then calculate or multiply this out to see what we end up getting. Well, the first one I get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. The second one I get a squared minus b squared. The third one I get a squared minus b squared because they're conjugates of each other. The, th the fourth one I get a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. You can multiply them out on your own, but none of them produce the sum of squares. That's brute force. I'm trying every possibility and none of them are producing uh, the sum of squares, so therefore you cannot factor the sum of squares where into integers at the very least, like some, some binomial where there are integers in there.